Even though it's now over 40 years since Cyclone Tracy wreaked its havoc on Darwin, causing death and destruction in our city, it's very possible that for many people outside the Territory, that event is still the strongest image they have of us, one of the few things they actually know about us. That on Christmas Day in 1974, Darwin was blown away by a cyclone called Tracy. The other big story about Darwin is also death about death and destruction, the bombings of 1942, which destroyed the city and killed scores of citizens. For years, little was known about these World War II events, but that's changing. The story is slowly growing in stature and national significance, especially the commemoration each year on the 19th of February. Tourists and locals can now immerse themselves in the stories of that period through visiting our defence and military museums and inspecting some of the physical remains from World War II, the remaining buildings at East Point Reserve and the old storage tunnels in town. There's no doubt that the story of the bombing of Darwin is a very powerful one. So is the story of the cyclone. It's not surprising then that our tourist operators are running successful tours that focus on both these stories with their common theme of destruction. And again, there's no doubt that these two important stories for our city are two important stories for our city. But my concern is that there is so much more to Darwin and the Territory than two events of destruction, one through war, the other through natural disaster. Both took terrible tolls on our city and its citizens. And that, of course, should never be forgotten. And those stories will continue to be told and respected. But I would like to suggest that we expand our Darwin and Territory narrative. And if you want to be inspired how that can happen, take a look at the new exhibition at the State Library. It's called A Territory Story. Mickey was very much involved in its development. And while it recognised cyclone and war, it shows that those events are part of a much more complex and broader sweep of Territory history, starting tens of thousands of years ago and running through to the latest provocative NT News headline. Two of the stories featured in this exhibition are ones that we should be telling more fully and more confidently. Both stories unique to the Territory and both are stories that have shaped the Territory we are today. So what are these stories? Well, I'm putting in my bid for the story of the Territory's self-government and the story of Aboriginal land rights, both of them immense and long-lasting achievements for the Northern Territory. For 100 years, no new government had been established in Australia until ours was in 1978. And after land rights legislation was introduced in the Territory in 1976, no other jurisdiction was prepared to make the same recognition of Aboriginal Australians' relationship and rights to land. I'm not pretending that self-government and land rights were straightforward events to manage for the Territory, that there was some kind of smooth trajectory, not at all. Being a self-governing self territory has, over its 40 years, to put it kindly, had some ups and downs. And land rights at times has been at the centre of bitter and long-lasting divisions in our community. But that does not lessen the importance of telling these two stories, both to ourselves and to the rest of Australia. Mickey and I together I wrote about a territory self-government journey in our book, Speak for Yourself published here by CDU in 2012. We both found it fascinating to learn firsthand about the challenges and successes of the first eight territory governments, told from the perspective of the eight chief ministers, myself included. The book's primary focus is on what it was like to be a chief minister leading a government that did not have full independence or full powers to run its own affairs, that upper hand being held by the Commonwealth. So the relationship between chief ministers and successive Australian governments was crucial. Sometimes that relationship was smooth and mature, other times full of tensions and provocations. Our second chief minister, Ian Tuxworth, felt that there was a conspiracy to collapse the territory system. This was in the Hawke years. So the Commonwealth could, say, could take it back and say that we should never have gone down that road in the first place and that self-government was a bad mistake. Our third Chief Minister, Steve Hatton, reckoned that the Commonwealth, even a decade after self-government, was treating the Territory like an authority of the Federal Government, 
and that their overriding view of us was, bloody territory, they're all cowboys. However, our first Chief Minister, Paul Everingham's big challenge with the Commonwealth was negotiating, negotiating the terms of self-government. He remembers there were essentially no rules or guidelines for those negotiations, and that he and Marshall Perham pretty much figured it out for themselves. He recalls endless meetings, back and forth, Darwin and Canberra, being on aeroplanes, wearing the Commonwealth down, and somehow managing to twist Malcolm Fraser's arm. That first challenge out of the way, there were so many more things to be tackled by our first Territory Government, ranging from a public service who everyone considered had a work ethos, ethos of how we can stop you dead, of how we can stop you getting something done, to a still sceptical population who wasn't sure about this self-government thing, to tackling the conditions of the Aboriginal communities. Everingham describes this legacy, legacy from the Commonwealth as pretty disgraceful. But while the burden of a new government was substantial, Everingham, who was only 35 years at the time, saw opportunities. If I were called upon to name the single most attractive feature of territory politics at this time, he said, I would say it lay in a lack of precedent, the freedom of choice left to the new government, as it makes policy decisions on matters settled in other parts of Australia. There's so much more to this story of self-government, and it's definitely not a boring or tedious one. The personalities, the problems, the conflicts, the politics, the frustrations, but importantly, the achievements are all there. And so are all our chief ministers, now up to 11 in number. They're all alive and well. But I often wonder how different our self-government story might have been in 1975 if the ter Territory had taken up Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser's offer of statehood in five years. At the time, the political energy was focused on challenges of negotiating self-government, so the offer was allowed to lapse. In retrospect, it was a real shame. Malcolm Fraser recognised that and told me much later on that he felt the Territory had been disadvantaged by not being a state, and he was sorry that he had not insisted on statehood at the time. The Territory's land rights story intersects with the story of self-government, but this is a narrative that needs to be told in its own right. The land came process in the Territory is where, for me, many years, legitimate Aboriginal aspiration and political rhetoric and opportunity collided. Excluded from being a player in the land came process because the Land Rights Act was Commonwealth law, successive Territory governments used the threat of claims as a political wedge. Usually it was the Territory's development or our lifestyle that was under threat. Think the handover of Uluru, the bitter debate around Coronation Hill, mining, fishing and access to waterways, or even the prospect of a suburban backyard under claim. But despite the years of intense political attacks on the Land Rights Act and the land claim process, there has been a remarkable level of success for Aboriginal Territorians, because 50% of the Territory's land and coastline has been returned to them, is Aboriginal land. And although the struggle for many Aboriginal groups has been a long and difficult one, there have been iconic events along the journey, from the bark petitions sent to Canberra by the Yolngu, the walk-off at Wave Hill led by Vincent Lingiari, the Woodward Commission and its recommendations that formed the basis of the Land Rights Act, and then since that time, the holding of so many joyous handback ceremonies all throughout the Territory, as land has been returned to traditional owners. My guess is that very few non-Aboriginal Territorians know much about land rights at all, or if they do, it's framed by where they can't go or a permit they need. And mostly, I think, that's because the Territory still has a highly transient population. So my argument is this evening that the Territory has two unique and important stories that we should be telling, both to Territorians and to our visitors. Because as I see it, self-government and land rights have more profoundly influenced and defined who we are than any other events over the past 40 years. <coughs> 